I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. So I will fight if you'll fight. Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight. Oh, we can make it through this like sailors in a tempest. Like sailors in a tempest together. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good afternoon everyone welcome to the lung cancer living room we're so happy uh, to have all of you with us from uh, wherever you are in the country or the world um, tonight or this afternoon we're going to be talking about how lung cancer is not taking a back seat during these unprecedented times uh, and neither are we care must go on and here to talk with us about how care is going on um, in these uh, uncharted or during these times of, you know, uncertainty and, um, like I said, unprecedented times is Dr. David Gandera, whom um, I'm sure you all have seen on previous living rooms. He is no stranger um, to this program, and we are thrilled to have him here with us today. Uh, Dr. Gandera is a professor of medicine emeritus, director of thoracic oncology, senior advisor to the director at UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. He's a medical oncologist and researcher and um, has been working in lung cancer for a very, very, very long time. So we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have him with us today. Um, as you guys know, um, we've been doing these rapid response living rooms for the last couple of months now. Um, I hope you're tuning in. If you haven't been able to see them, uh, please go to our website and uh, check them out because we've had some really amazing um, speakers and information. Uh, come out to share with you. So um, as you guys see, Bonnie's not here with me, but as I mentioned last week, she is moderating online. So hi, mom, wherever you're watching from, I'm not sure if it's uh, Facebook or YouTube, but be sure to give her a shout out um, online there and and, uh, and have a chat with her. As always, um, um, you know, nothing changes, even though we're doing this uh, virtually, we encourage questions uh, throughout. So uh, we've got some folks online moderating um, for, and looking for those questions so that you can get them to us so that we can ask them of our, uh, of our guest speaker. Um, I want to give you guys a heads up, and I'm going to let you know also at the end of this meeting, um, I'll remind you again that we are yet again sort of changing the dynamic of the living room and what it looks like. We will still be doing a rapid response uh, the first Tuesday of every month in the afternoon, 1 o'clock Pacific time. And then we will be returning to our regularly scheduled uh, third Tuesday of the month, 5.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time meetings as well. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more of that information at the end of the meeting. Um, with that, I want to jump into our conversation because, as you guys know, we've only got an hour and we want to use up every, uh, every bit of that hour asking and getting uh, some information from Dr. Gandera. So, welcome, Dr. Gandera. Thank you for joining us um, today. And I thought maybe we would, you know, start into this conversation with you telling us a little bit about yourself and why you chose thoracic oncology as an area of interest. Well, thank you, Danielle. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, for those of you who are uh, living room aficionados, you've seen me there countless times over the years. Uh, but always in person. So this is the first time that this is a virtual living room. And I, I think it's a nice venue. We're doing everything 
uh, virtual these days. Uh, before I tell you about myself, uh, I can tell you that I am quite impressed to see the title for Danielle. CPO, Chief <laughs> Patient Officer. So I know about CEOs and COOs and CFOs for corporation, but this is the first time I have seen a CEO. I think it's a wonderful title for you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gandera. Uh, so my story uh, is that um, when I was in medical school, we'll start back there, uh, every rotation I went on to, I thought, this is what I'm going to do. This is what uh, I like. Uh, and it, these were totally different. One was plastic surgery, and the next one was pathology, and the next one was radiology or whatever. And I, I love them all. But then when I got into my internal medicine rotations, I said, this is really being statistician. And I'm a, a big fan of Sherlock Holmes and deductive reasoning, so I, I like that. Then within internal medicine, when I was in my internship residency, um, at first I, I thought I might want to be an endocrinologist, and uh, I liked hematology. There wasn't uh, the sort of um, advances being done in oncology at that time. And the more I got into the field of hematology oncology, and saw what was being done in leukemia, uh, I said, it's oncology where the challenge is. That's where the advances are going to be made, and I want to be part of that. Now, it took a while longer to get into lung cancer. When I started, uh, when I just finished my fellowship, I was uh, doing uh, clinical trials and investigations in breast cancer and lymphoma. Those were more easily treatable diseases. And as I saw that, I said, there's a real opportunity here for me to get into lung cancer. There aren't that many people doing it. It's a huge unmet need. There are many, many patients. We need to develop better treatments for them. So I did. And the story goes on from there uh, that uh, I've had great career. I think I've made lots of contributions in different ways. And uh, one of the things that Danielle and Bonnie know is that within my expertise as a thoracic oncologist, I pride myself on the ability to communicate at many levels, whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer with another oncologist, whether it's uh, a publisher, but specifically with patients and patient caregivers. So uh, I'm happy to meet with you today and to talk about some of the changes that have come about and some of the things that have not changed now COVID is with us. Thank you, Dr. Gander. Um, oh, I'm hearing feedback. I hope nobody else is hearing that. Um, so thank you very much for that. that um, lovely uh, introduction to you and who you are. And I, I couldn't agree with you more that um, you are a master at being able to explain some very scary and complicated um, situations to patients and their caregivers. And I've heard time and time again, whether here in the living room, uh, when you've been to join us or from patients that you know we work with that I know um, are patients of yours, uh, saying how much that means to them and how, how uh, much easier it sort of made their journey and their, and their decision making. So thank you for being you. Um, with that, I want to jump into the meat of our conversation today. Um, lung cancer patients, as you well know, uh, have expressed concerns about delays in treatment and care, especially during you know, these last couple, two, three months. Um, there are also challenges that some of them are having with second opinion appointments being canceled or delayed. How has treatment changed in the time of COVID-19? what should and should not be delayed, and what role is telemedicine playing from your perspective in the academic setting? Um, we can start with some general conversation around it and then walk through some different sort of um, disciplines and areas, be it screening, diagnostic, surgery, medical oncology, so on and so forth. Okay, well, thanks. Maybe I'll start with 
a question that um, many patients are um, quite interested in, and that's in the time of COVID, should my treatments be delayed? Should they be changed? Or should things go on exactly the way um, they would have before? Um, and the answer to that is it depends. It depends on where that oncologist, uh, let's just say we're talking about a medical oncologist, where they practice in the world. So not only within the United States, but within the world. All of you know, because we are overwhelmed with news about COVID, how different this disease is, uh, how the, the incidence and the severity is quite different from place to place around the world. Uh, some in Europe, some in Asia, and even within the United States, uh, where in the New York, Boston, Connecticut area, uh, it's been devastating. So with that being said, in California, we have been uh, both fortunate and I think um, maybe proactive about very early on trying to find out uh, who's positive for a COVID test, and also to equip both our doctors and nurses and everyone else within the hospital and outpatient system with PPE, personal protective equipment, and pr provide it to the patients. So we um, have a relatively flat curve at UC Davis. On the East Coast, I saw for the first time today the curve for one of the major medical centers in New York City. And for the first time in six weeks, it has begun to flatten. So that the reason I give this sort of introduction is if a patient is, let's say, in New York City, they have just had their diagnosis of lung cancer, and it's an early stage, and they're waiting for surgery. Many of those institutions have simply not been able to do those sorts of surgeries because every bed in the hospital was full of COVID patients, every bed in the intensive care unit, in the recovery room, and the hallway were, were full of COVID patients, many of whom were very ill. So uh, then the issue is well, do you bring in a healthy patient with stage one lung cancer? to do surgery and then expose them. So it's not an easy uh, question to answer, but I can tell you what patients think. Now, I, I assume the great majority of you uh, who will listen to this are patients or families or caregivers. Patients uniformly have told me that while COVID may kill me, my cancer will kill me if it's not treated appropriately. There, um, we know from many studies, for example, that the surgical kind of patient that I was talking about, if we delay surgery more than six, eight, 12 weeks, that the prognosis is worse because that gives more time for the cancer to have spread to other areas, even if you can't see it on a scan, a PET scan or a CT scan, uh, micrometastases. I did um, a social media poll where I asked just, I said, now that COVID has hit us, would you arbitrarily delay chemotherapy or immunotherapy or both in a patient with stage four non-small cell lung cancer. And it was a poll. And I had 357 oncologists and other caregivers respond. 70% of the people said, no, I would not delay either one, assuming I could still give it within my system. And the remainder, that other 30%, some of them said, oh, I would delay immunotherapy, but not chemotherapy. Some of the others said I would delay chemotherapy, but not immunotherapy, like five or eight percent. And a few said I would delay both. I would hold them. But the majority, no matter where they were in the world, said 
no, I need to treat the patient like I would have ordinarily. And patients chimed in on this. And as I said, they said, don't withhold that treatment for me. So at UC Davis, we've been very fortunate in that we have not had to delay patients' treatments. And we'll talk about later, we also have not had to shut down our clinical trial program, which is incredibly important in terms of bringing uh, new treatments to patients. Now, some of the things that we've done, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, Danielle, but no, 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 no. in terms Go of ahead. general, and, and other places have done them, but we maybe had more time to do them. We had, I think, the very first patient in the United States in the ICU on a ventilator at UC Davis, way back when the state of Washington was having the COVID patients in nursing homes. So we were able to learn from that, and we implemented these procedures where we check temperatures before people come in the door. Everybody has PPE. Uh, we have minimized the amount of exposure for a patient to have to come in uh, to get treatment or blood work or scans. I can talk about that some more in the past, uh, in, in, uh, down the line in this conversation. But um, we've done all those things and it's been successful. Had we been in New York, I think we likely would have had to put everything on a hold, at least for a short time, just because the system was overwhelmed. I think that's a really um, very relevant point. It depends on sort of where you are in the system, where you are in the country, how far down the line you are in the learning, right? Because this is, you know, this is a new space for everyone. There's so much that we don't know. We're sort of trying to learn and, and, and fly the plane while as we're building it, right, in, in this area. And I know a lot of patients and a question has come in around data from the AACR that showed uh, lung cancer patients may, may have worse outcomes um, should they develop COVID. But to your point, there's a maybe factor still to, the, to that, that question when it comes to COVID versus a more definitive answer when it comes to just not treating your lung cancer. That's kind of what I hear you saying. Yes, that's correct. And yeah. of course, we can't prevent an individual from being exposed to COVID out in the community. But we can, once they enter our system, we can test and we can make sure that everything is absolutely as safe as possible. And, and I think throughout the United States now and, and most other countries, people have figure out, figured out how to do this, just like you figured out how to order e-groceries. <laughs> where you put in your order and you go to the grocery store and they you flip open your trunk uh, automatically, electronically, and the, they put the groceries in, you close your trunk, you drive home. So all of these things uh, have changed the way we're living. It may not be necessary for the long run, but some of the things I think are going to stick, and a lot of them have to do with patient care. And it's because it's made things better for people. Yeah, I love that. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, better not only within the healthcare system, but when it comes to actual public health and transmission of other, you know, potential viruses or, or um, illnesses. So can you talk a little bit about how, if at all, you, you talked a little bit about already about how, um, at a high level, about how some, some, to some degree, it's been business as usual. Um, uh, I, and I know a lot of patients walking are uh, watching right now. The screening conversation isn't necessarily relevant because they're already living with lung cancer, right? But I always like to bring it up during uh, meetings like this to remind uh, patients out there living with lung cancer that it, they are primed for having the screening conversation with loved ones and family members that you know that, that they know that might qualify. How has screening been affected uh, at UC Davis? Well, um, we don't have a huge screening program, but we have an active screening program. To my knowledge, uh, there has been some reduction in the uh, amount of people being screened. And I think it's valid that um, this is not a patient with a nodule that we already know about who's being worked up for that. 
those workups have gone on uh, without much change. But in a patient who just comes in to their primary care physician, and uh, let's say they're new with this physician, and they say, um, you know, I smoked for 30 years, I smoked a pack of year, a pack of cigarettes per day, and I quit 15 years ago. Uh, I'd like to be screened. I think the patient and the physician can make a joint decision that let's give this for six weeks or two months if needed and see what the situation is uh, before you get screened. Uh, so it's again, it's a different sort of situation from a patient where the physician says, we already screened you. We, we found a nodule that could be cancer. Uh, and are you willing to go ahead and get worked up for that? which might mean a bronchoscopy or a biopsy, uh, scans, et cetera, uh, or do you want to wait? Uh, and, and that primary care physician would also say, our radiologist or our pulmonologist, whoever has that expertise, has said that your nodule that was found, this is just an example, uh, mm -hmm. is high risk for cancer, or it's low risk. In other words, you do have a nodule, but, you know, I think everybody who looked at this scan, and this is where tumor boards, virtual tumor boards come in, they all agreed that the likelihood is that this is some benign process. It's a, an old, what we call granuloma from some exposure you had when you were young. It's not likely to be lung cancer. On the other hand, the next patient, maybe the physician says, you know, your nodule, it looks very early stage, but it looked like it, it is likely to be cancer. And in that patient, of course, you would advise uh, the patient to go ahead and get the evaluation done. So I think um, what I'm hearing you say, and in a perfect world, and of course I know based on the m multitude of conversations you and I have had over the years that this is what you do. You have these conversations with your patients. You assess the sort of risk reward, um, you know, what should we be doing right now versus what, what can maybe wait. And I, I wish I could tell you I hear stories like that from patients around the country and around the world, but I don't necessarily. But again, um, one of the things I love about you explaining this to our patient community is these are conversations they can then go back and have with, with their physicians. That's a little it's a little side note that I want the community to know that this shared decision-making process and these conversations with your healthcare team are so, so important um, in, in determining your care, your treatment path, but also in making you feel better in your understanding about the whys behind some of these decisions are being made. So we've moved into this diag. Sure. If I can just add, Danielle, yeah, um, Danielle my um, advice to my patients advice or to... Or to I'm sorry, all of a sudden I'm getting feedback. Okay, it's gone now. My advice is if you don't ask the question, you won't get an answer. So for many physicians, particularly those that are quite busy, they have a way of approaching things. And they may say, here's my advice to you. But if you say, you as the patient, if you say, you know, I want to know the pros and cons. I want to know the risk and benefits about whatever the question is, whether it's, should I get this kind of treatment? Should I get a workup? How long should I delay? Most physicians will then say, okay, this is a patient who wants that sort of interaction, who wants to be part of the decision process. Now you may say that should be every patient, but again, uh, that's not necessarily how everybody approaches it. But what I'm saying is that almost everyone is going to stop, you know, and quit typing or put down their pen, whatever it is. And they're going to talk to you as the patient uh, because they, they then realize you want that direct feedback. That's a really great point because um, you're right. Not, uh, some patients are just like, no, I want you to tell me what to do. I don't want to know. I don't want any information. Just point me in the right direction. So that's a that's also a very real thing. Um, so I want to run into some di diagnostics. And this time we talked a little bit about screening. Uh, you know, delays 
versus um, somebody we already know has, has a diagnosis? Um, are, you, are you more likely in these times, or is this also dependent on the patient, to do um, um, a bronchoscopy, as you said, and go for a solid tumor bi biopsy, or are you using liquid biopsies more often these days uh, just to sort of mitigate risks? Well, that's another uh, question where there's no simple answer. I guess there aren't too many in lung cancer where there are simple answers, but I think that depends on the situation where you are as a patient, and I mean what your location is. In some institutions, let's say one of those big East Coast institutions that I was talking about, which has had a horrible problem with COVID, all of their pulmonary physicians which would do the bronchoscopy, are all in the ICU trying to help with COVID patients. Do you see what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? So they may be less available. On the other hand, a, a radiologist in that institution um, may still be able to do an interventional biopsy, a CT-guided biopsy. So it depends on the situation. Um, at UC Davis, we've been very fortunate in that we have, that we have uh, some have pulmonary some physicians pulmonary who are really who dedicated, are really dedicated. Uh, to lung cancer, and they've been able to work with us. And, and when we've needed biopsies, we've been able to get them done uh, within the same amount of time we usually do. It doesn't mean we aren't using liquid biopsy more. We are. And in fact, uh, later this year, we will have a workshop sponsored by ISLC, our International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, in September uh, on this very subject, the two-day workshop, uh, so that we can bring all physicians and interested parties up to date on when would we substitute a blood test for a biopsy. We obviously need a biopsy of lung cancer. In other words, we can't make that determination typically from blood. But when do you rebiopsy versus doing a blood circulating tumor DNA? More and more, we have situations in lung cancer <clears throat> where the answer is blood first. In other words, do the blood test. If it identifies what you're looking for, you don't have to go further. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to have some water. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's not my COVID cough. That's my allergy cough. <laughs> everybody has. Everybody feels they have to give the big disclaimer when they cough or sneeze these days. <laughs> mm. So uh, someone sent out a tweet a couple of days ago, which said, um, um, "Your tweet will go viral if you don't put a mask on it." <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. It's very clever. That is very clever. Um, okay, I want to make sure we have enough time to get into all of all of the things we planned on talking about today. Of course, we can always have you back again um, um, if we don't get to everything. So, we, I, I, a, I want to say that I'm I'm anxious to see that data and hear um, the information around the liquid biopsies because I know we get a lot of questions from uh, from patients um, about that very thing. So. I'm uh, looking forward to that in September. Um, medical oncology. Some things have changed um, from coverage, you know, around CMS and at-home infusions uh, for those where that, that might be an option. Um, dosing regimens, you know, what are targeted therapy, you know, patients or sort of what does the patient experience look like right now between a, an, an infusion patient versus a targeted therapy patient? There, there's a lot of good, COVID is so bad, but there is a lot of good which is coming out of the situation where things are being made easier and better for both patients and physicians that I don't think are going to go away after uh, COVID calms down. <clears throat> and one of those is the acceptance by insurers like CMS, Medicare, uh, to uh, allow reimbursement for video visits. 
And, and what I mean by this, some of you uh, patients who are on or who are watching this will have already gone through a video visit. Maybe some of you will have not. But in a video visit, and I had a clinic uh, a couple of days ago or late last week where every single one of my patients, including new patients, were with video visits. So uh, when we engage in a video visit, it's scheduled ahead of time. Uh, you do it from your iPhone, although you can do it from an iPad. And uh, the patient logs in. I log in. I can see the patient. The patient can see me. And I conduct my interview just the way I would if I was face-to-face -face with them uh, in the clinic. <laughs> I review their scans with them. I review their pathology or molecular uh, results, and I uh, make recommendations to them. So these are legal. They are billable uh, so that the physician and the institution does get reimbursed. It's covered, again, by Medicare or insurers. Um, the only thing I can't do is a physical exam. So I'll, I'll just tell you a quick um, Anecdote, I, I did a video exam on a patient last week, and the patient had a complaint, and I asked the patient's son to take a look in her mouth. And I said, what do you see? And he told me. And I said, I think I know why she's not eating and why she's losing weight. So, you know, this is... Um, you know, just a little aside, but you cannot examine the patient, but sometimes you can ask them in ways or you can do things to help figure out what's going on. Uh, I, I'm really a fan of these video visits, and I think patients uh, actually like them uh, very well. You can imagine in this time of COVID, but also, let's say COVID wasn't with us. Many of my patients live 100 miles away or 200 miles away, or some of my patients fly in to see me. If I if it's a routine visit, so not the first visit necessarily or whatever, and I can do that as a video visit, it's fantastic. It, it really saves everyone time and effort and money. Uh, so video visits are, are one thing that's been done, and I'll come back to this maybe in a few minutes about how this applies to clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, our ability to get the patient's laboratory and scans near where they live, I've been doing that all along. But for some institutions, they said, oh, no, you have to come to us and get your scan at our place. Well, that's better probably because you know those radiologists. You can call them up go over the films. But I'm saying it's not mandatory. And then lastly, mobile phlebotomy. So having the ability to send uh, someone to the patient's home who can draw their blood, take it to the laboratory, have it run without the patient coming in, minimizes the exposure of that patient to potential uh, for COVID or coronavirus. You know, they probably should be calling this coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 because yeah. um, COVID implies the disease that's caused from it. But at any rate, you know what I'm talking about. I know what, you, I know what you're talking about. I want to, uh, you, you talked about mobile. For, oh, mm -hmm. Just, just yeah. one, one addition, particularly for, for blood work. We're now uh, doing a lot of molecular testing. You ask about when would we use blood to do a molecular profile instead of using a biopsy. Uh, one of the companies from the Bay Area, Garden Health, is very, very good about having a modal, mobile phlebotomy system throughout the country. And that helped me a week ago when we had a patient that uh, could not come in. And we were able to send a phlebotomist out to uh, obtain the specimen. And a week later, I had the result. I think that's great, and, and it's actually where I was going with this conversation. So we were we were on the same page with. Um, I want to take it one step further and say so. Assuming you have a telehealth um, appointment with one of your patients to go over the results 
of their biomarker testing, their comprehensive testing, really whether it was through a, a blood-based biopsy or, or a solid tumor. What does a, what does a conversation like that look like? Is it more challenging? Should the patients have their, re, their patient-friendly report in front of them while you... I'm just curious because I know those are really hard for patients to understand in person, let alone over a video. Right. Well, let's just take um, Garden as an example. Foundation Medicine Blood is very similar. When I view a patient's report, uh, I can uh, check a box that means that it's been automatically uh, to the patient. It's sent to them, mm -hmm. which I always do. So I like for that have the information when they see me in person but it's more important that they have it in front of them when we do a video visit way i can see look down you know on page two this is the explanation for what this mutation does or i can say you see here where it says suv um i'm, I'm sorry uh, VUS, SUV is a pet scan, VUS, variant of unknown significance, that that means we don't know that this mutation means anything in your case. It could just be some genetic material which doesn't have a function. So yes, uh, it's, it's a little different, but I think it's, it's not more difficult. It's just different, different than face-to-face. But I think it might even be an example to your earlier point of how we will be able to use tele, telehealth or telemedicine, whichever you want to call it, post-virus crisis, right? Um, in situations like this, this might be a good example of rather than the patient having to travel in, particularly if they're 100 or 200 miles away, um, you can have this telehealth visit to go over results such as you know, the, the biomarker testing. Yes, I don't think these don't things think are things going things to go away. Right. Yeah, which is good news for a lot of people who will have access to folks like you and others that they wouldn't otherwise have have access to. And I know, um, you know, there's potentially some licensure issues that need to be kind of weeded out or, or figured out for some physicians anyway to um, be able to practice, you know, across state lines or out of states that they are licensed in. But I think um, this is really pointing us in the right direction. Um, to, to make some of those modifications and, and changes. Well, you talked a little bit about um, the clinical trials that are going on at UC Davis. How have they or have they not um, had to adapt during this time? Because I know a lot of areas around the country, and again, dependent on where you are, have had to close down and or stop um, some of the research and, and clinical trials that they're doing due to uh, the virus. Well, this has been this has one of been the greatest challenges. challenges. And I'm sorry, uh, periodically I'm hearing echo. I don't know if other people are hearing that or not. No? At any rate, mm -hmm. uh, it's been one of the challenges uh, globally. Oncology is probably the most uh, engaged in clinical trials of any specialty. You know, cancer patients are special. Uh, our treatments oftentimes are limited, or we have good treatment, but then the cancer figures out a way to get around the treatment. We call that acquired resistance. And it's only through clinical trials that we find better therapies, new therapies, ways to handle these situations when the cancer becomes resistant. And these days, it doesn't matter whether the trial is a phase three trial or a phase one trial. It is quite likely to be beneficial to that patient. So how do we do that in the time of COVID? Well, if you're if you're, is so overwhelmed with patients in the ICU, uh, one New York hospital last week said they had 500 patients in their hospital. That's a whole hospital for many places with COVID associated problems. It's very difficult for them to say, we're gonna go ahead and do clinical trials just like we always did. Their clinical research associates, the people that do the work for the clinical trials, often have been taken off those duties and applied to COVID testing. In other words, they're helping out with the COVID situation. Or they've been even declared non-essential, not at UC Davis, but some other places, so it's complicated. 
At UC Davis, we've been very fortunate in that we have not had to close any trials, and we have continued to accrue just the way we've always done. But both the National Cancer Institute and the FDA have made it easier. One of those things is allowing video visits. If you're a patient and you're listening to this, you'll know that on a clinical trial, for your safety, we have to do close, closer mining, maybe more frequent visits. The FDA and the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, have said, Dan, this is an extraordinary situation. We will allow video visits if it's a routine visit because that allows the patient to continue to get a clinical trial or maybe to go on a clinical trial. If we required those face-to-face -face visits, it wouldn't happen. Even video consenting. So again, if you're a patient on this, uh, on this uh, YouTube now, you know that you had to go through an informed consent process and physically sign an informed consent to allow you to go on a clinical trial. We can now do that by video uh, consulting or video consenting, where someone, the physician, the CRC, is on the line with you, talking to you, maybe Zoom face-to-face, -face, and going over the document with you, you have either an electronic or a hard copy, which has been provided to you ahead of time, you provide an electronic signature. That's so important. Many patients said, you know, this trial, I know it's the right thing for me to do. I don't want to have to come in or maybe come 200 miles just to sign a form. So now we don't have to do that. And the central IRB or the National Cancer Institute has also authorized this. Now, if it's an industry-sponsored trial by one of the companies that makes new cancer drugs, some of them are allowing these things, some of them say no, and some of them have shut down the trials in midstream. They say, we, we don't feel it's safe to accrue more patients. I think that depends on the situation. Again, in California, especially Northern California, I think we're fortunate in that we're able to do clinical trials um, with some modifications uh, and continue to offer them to patients. I think I really wish, it's just making me think, I really wish we heard more about these positive things on the news, right? Like, especially when it comes to sheltering in place and people getting antsy and you know, I, I remember early on when um, the governor put the shelter in place in order back in early towards mid-March, uh, we thought it was going to be a, a, a couple of weeks and so nobody really hummed and hawed about it. Um, but now that we're several weeks in, um, like I said, and the people are getting antsy, they're not, I don't think they're realizing that this was the point, right? Because they're like, oh, here we did all of this and we sheltered in place and then nothing really happened. Like life went on for patients, as your, per your example, in the clinical trial space. Well, the point was for nothing to happen. That was the whole point of, of putting all these precautions into place. And also, PS, it's allowed patients who are dependent on this type of care, at least in this area, to still be able to receive it. And I just, I wish we talked about that more, especially when people are starting to fight at grocery stores over toilet paper, or now flour, I guess, I don't know. Can I add Can I add this? Yes, yes. please. This is incredibly important. And when I say we're doing well at UC Davis or they're doing well at Stanford or they're doing well at UCSF, all of our regional centers or Kaiser or, or wherever else it might be, it's because precautions were taken early. Uh, PPE was made available. You, you remember there was about a month where it was felt that there was not human to human transmission of the coronavirus. So once that became apparent, which you could trace back to February, end of February at least, uh, I think most places in the Bay Area, hospitals, clinics, systems said, we need to start early. We can't wait until we are seeing 500 new patients a day, you know, with COVID. Uh, so I think 
if you're in the Bay Area in particular, and I realize that some of you on this YouTube may be across the country or across the world, you know, these sort of precautions are why we have a flattening curve. They are the reason. This is just like uh, when somebody says, well, why should I be worried about patients who get cancer or donate to cancer research? I don't have it. Well, I can tell you, having one of your family members or ones or friends have a serious illness changes you. A physician, there is no way that you take these things lightly. It, it's, you know, you cannot conceive of people who would not think about their fellow man, you know, their parents, their grandparent, the guy next door, and, and say that I'm going to do whatever I can to keep them safe. Anyway, that's my little preaching for yeah, the day. No. And I, I think I, th I, I am right there with you. And I think, like I said, and like you've said throughout this thing, you know, um, it's not the, the, the way it's things are happening and able to continue to go on in California are definitely not the way they've been able to continue or go on in the, in the northeast of this country and, and other parts of the world. So um, I think that the lesson here to all of you watching is to continue your shelter in place orders and using your safety precautions. Um, when you when you have to leave your home because it it works. Um, okay, so um, we both got up on our little <laughs> soapboxes there for a second. Um, so I'm trying to to kind of make a determination because I know I'm being mindful of time. I know um, we have a hard stop at two o'clock. We've got you know 12 minutes or so left. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about. Um, how you're using and um, tel telemedicine um, in the second opinion arena. In other words, how the physicians prepare for that appointment and uh, how the patients should potentially prepare for that appointment um, using the care everywhere example, if you will. Right. Well, uh, some people uh, who are tuned in may not know what care everywhere is. So maybe I'll start with that. Uh, this is an innovation that has been in place for maybe three or four years in some areas in which uh, all the hospital systems, and th this is not just in the Bay Area, this is throughout the United States, uh, can be linked if they agree with a program called Care Everywhere so that the records, the laboratory tests, the scans, the uh, visit notes, the infusion center notes can be viewed by somebody else who sees that patient uh, in real time. So up until recently, we would have to have records sent to us, FedEx to us, fax to us, so that, for example, when I saw a patient, I could see what the primary care doctor or the primary oncologist had said in their note, I could see the results of the molecular testing and so forth. Now, when I see a patient, uh, and this would be face-to-face -face or video visit, I can go into our EPIC system, our uh, electronic medical record, and look under Stanford and click on it and pull up the notes from one of the oncologists there or the scan report, oh, or it could be Boston. I can look uh, at the records from uh, an institution in Boston and do the same thing. So for a patient who is going to get a video visit, let's say a second opinion, it's important uh, for them to make sure that the oncologist who's going to see them in a video visit has the information that they need and, and preferably ahead of time. Uh, I used to tell the patients, copy everything and bring hard copies to me because if it doesn't get sent ahead of time, I will have it. These days with care everywhere, I can see it all. Um, and again, most institutions are part of this. Um, so from the patient standpoint, the best thing or the most important thing they can do is to make sure that the person giving the second opinion has the information on hand at the time of the video visit. Uh, the worst thing is to undergo a face-to-face -face visit or a video visit, and the person giving a second opinion says, 
I don't have the results of this test or the results of this scan. We're going to have to follow up uh, so that I can look over that information. On the part of the physician, uh, it's once again, making sure that they have that needed information, what's essential to see. And with care everywhere, that's uh, very easy these days in most cases. Wonderful, love that. Um, I know we were going to talk a little bit about um, um, how sort of this telehealth is being used physician to physician in a, uh, by way of virtual uh, tumor conferences or tumor boards, but I think it deserves more than you know the three or four minutes we can give it. So I'd like to hold that until next time. And I, I really want to get your um, sort of some final thoughts from you. You know, there's no playbook for recovery. Uh, what how, and you know, and I use the word recovery loosely, um, but I think it's it's valid on how you see everything we've talked about in lung cancer from screenings, diagnosis, and treatments moving back towards normal. You've touched on a little bit about how it, it'll probably be some combination of you know physical versus um, virtual visits. How how do you see that playbook sort of being written? Well, no, uh, no one knows the answer, obviously, but I, I do think that COVID is not going away. I think it's new and it is different. Influenza would be a much worse disease if we did not have vaccines and that if we didn't have most people getting the vaccine. If we develop uh, a vaccine for this coronavirus, in a reasonable amount of time, and if it works, then we will be in a different situation. On the other hand, if it's difficult to develop an effective vaccine, then we could be in the same situation we're in now for years to come. Um, so it, it depends on what happens. I don't know if I will ever shake anybody's hand again. My elbows are getting very good. <laughs> and greeting and greeting. So um, our meetings, our medical meetings, uh, some of you who are on this uh, YouTube uh, know what the term AACR means or ASCO, ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology. It's coming up at the end of this month and it is going to be virtual, no face-to-face. -face. This is the biggest cancer meeting in the world one of the most important. So that requires also a different skill set for the oncologist because there are certain things you want to see or hear. It's all virtual now. Um, the same thing AACR just had their meeting a couple of weeks ago, totally virtual. Their typical attendance, I think, is around 25 or 30,000 people. They had 60,000 people sign up for the virtual meeting. So the good news is that oncologists and, and other doctors, surgeons, radiation doctors, that we're all, we're continuing to learn about new information and get new information, but it's in different ways. Um, so uh, I think we will be doing video visits. We'll be doing a lot of things differently for the long run, regardless of whether COVID comes or goes. <laughs> I agree with you. It's, 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 I think it's taking a while for um, people to get used to some of these adaptations, um, but I think they're, they're, they're happening and they're happening in, uh, in positive ways. And I'm with you on the handshaking. I don't, I don't know that a lot of people are going to feel comfortable uh, shaking, shaking hands again. So we've got about five minutes left. And um, of course, um, you know, I have to do some, uh, some housekeeping and so thank you, Dr. Gandera, for, um, uh, for all of your words of wisdom today. Like I said, I would love to have you back to uh, have a conversation about how you yourself have been using this virtual sort of space um, for many years now in, the, um, in working with, with other hospitals and other physicians to go over um, lung cancer patient uh, cases. Because I think it's important for the patients to understand too how their doctors, particularly in some of the more rural communities, um, have been benefiting for a long time um, from, from technology like this. So um, I want everybody to know um, a little bit about uh, this week's uh, updates in the joint statement. 
uh, that we have put out on COVID-19 and what you can expect to find in it if you haven't already uh, been there to see. Uh, so we um, are talking a little bit about what are the implications of COVID-19 for my personal cancer treatment? How do I make sense of contradictory COVID-19 information? What are the impacts of COVID-19 on cancer research? So all three of those uh, questions are answered in the joint statement on our website at uh, gotofoundation.org. Um, as I say uh, every month or every week lately, um, uh, we've been talking a lot about isolation and how difficult it is. Um, please, please, please consider going to our website um, and see the many services and programs that we have to offer to you all to try to help alleviate some of those feelings of, of, of isolation. Um, our phone buddy program, as we've discussed before, uh, our social media channels. A lot of you are watching on Facebook right now. It's a great place to connect and, and learn about other patients. Um, online support uh, through Health Unlocked and Belong, our telephone uh, uh, support group network. Um, I've told you about the support group network and how a lot of um, uh, support groups around the country have converted to on online and or via telephone support groups. So please check out our website to see if there's one in your area. And uh, of course, our, our helpline, which is um, staffed by incredibly amazing people that I'm very proud uh, to work with at the ready to answer your questions. And the number is 1-800-298-2436. I think Rocky and uh, Penn TV have put it up a couple times during this broadcast. Um, for more information um, or any further questions about this living room, I know there was a couple of um, uh, specific questions, um, disease-specific or treatment-specific questions that came up. Uh, please email livingroom at gotofoundation.org, and we will try to get those uh, out to Dr. Gandera to uh, be answered if we can't answer them in-house. Uh, in closing, next week, um, uh, or our next regularly scheduled living room is May 19th. So this is what I was talking about at the beginning. We're going to be going back to the first and third Tuesdays of the month. So first Tuesday will be 1 p.m. just like it is now. Um, and the third Tuesdays will be 5.30 p.m. PST, both, both, uh, both times PST, um, as they were prior to everybody going uh, to this virtual space. So our next living room is May 19th at 5.30 with Dr. Lewis Reyes from Memorial Cancer Institute in Hollywood, Florida. And our next rapid response living room is June 2nd at 1 p.m., uh, stay tuned for topic and conversation. We obviously uh, want to be able to bring you the most relevant information, so we're uh, we're not quite ready to make a final decision on that yet. Uh, for events, I have a little bit more information that was sent out to me about some of the things that we're doing. So uh, our Summer Jam Virtual 5K Your Way is scheduled for June 20th. This event uh, was created to replace the canceled, unfortunately canceled, Dallas, Sacramento, and Portland 5Ks. Um, but they're taking it a step further, our events team, or we have an amazing events team, um, is taking it a step further and inviting people to participate from around uh, the country to make it a national event. So for more information, please, please, please uh, visit, visit our website to that. Again, I want to say thank you to Dr. Gandera um, for once again coming out and uh, sharing your expertise with us and supporting uh, GoTo Foundation, who we are and what we do. And, and I want to thank you again for your a uh, compliment on my uh, my fairly new title um, at the beginning of the session. It means the world to me uh, coming from you. Thank you to uh, Peninsula Television for uh, being able to get us all together and zoomed in on the back end here. Um, uh, I want to thank our supporters and then ask uh, Dr. Gandera to sign us off, but our supporters without um, whom we could not bring this to you, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol Miles Squibb, Mr. Miles Squibb Foundation, Genentech, Lily, Merck, Novartis, Oncocyte, Takeda, and Foundation Medicine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Dr. Gandera, I'll leave it uh, the last minute for you to say your goodbyes and some final words. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, I'm quite impressed with the CPO. I'll have to keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, I said that our ASCO meeting was coming up at the end of the month. There are several major advances in lung cancer, and maybe we'll talk about them at a living room at some time in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Gandera. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, and we'll talk soon. Okay, bye now. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave 
I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. So I will fight if you'll fight. Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight. Oh, we can make it through this like sailors in a tempest. Like sailors in a tempest together. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see.